My name is Micah Herskind, and I'll be reading the words of Lucy Harrell. If we want to live in safer, more sustainable communities, we have to make sure that everyone who has been marked by the criminal system has a direct line to college. I know many out there are envious of the fact that individuals in prison are about to have access to the Pell Grant again, when so many on the outside are struggling with student debt. I don't think anyone should have to struggle with student debt. And trust me, I feel your pain. I kept making monthly student loan payments for a year after I was incarcerated. And as a result, the Department of Education refused to grant me a loan deferment. I earned a bachelor's degree in journalism and worked in the field for 10 years before I was incarcerated. I knew that I wanted to use my time inside to finish my master's degree, but wasn't allowed to for a very long time. When I couldn't go to college, I spent my time in prison working with students of all ages at all stages of learning. I also got to know some brilliant educators who introduced quality high school and college classes to the bitter prison environment. Having daily contact with individuals who treated me as a person was refreshing. In 2018, after years of asking, proposing solutions, and orchestrating support, my mother met with the DOC man who made the phone call that got me transferred to Metro Transitional Center, where online independent study is an option. Within a year, I was wrapping up my master's degree and asking for permission to attend law school. Just as most people at the center go out into the community every day, I wanted to, needed to, be able to go in person. In my second year of requesting permission, the pandemic hit, and the American Bar Association, which oversees law school standards, provided a way. For the first time ever, and only temporarily, ABA accredited law schools went online. I began as a student at Atlanta's John Marshall Law School in August of 2020. Before law school, I explored countless online graduate programs and applied to four or five. Some had the box and some didn't. The first college I applied to was a progressive private law school in Vermont for a master's in restorative justice. Applying to that program was the first time I really considered the value of my carceral experience. Unfortunately, there was a box. And beyond the regular essay, I was also required to construct a lengthy, detailed affidavit of conviction. This made me super uncomfortable. The invasion was degrading, and the application process itself certainly didn't fit within the context of any restorative theories I knew of. The graduate school that stuck was South Dakota State University. Their application had no box on it and no weird requirements. I voluntarily talked to my professors and the program director about my situation and was welcomed and supported at all junctures. Not only that, but I told my peers right up front that I was still incarcerated. I was constantly told that my expertise on certain issues enriched our discussions and assignments. Earning a Master of Mass Communication allowed me to brush up on what I'd missed in the field and network with new people in it. It allowed me to start an important study on post-incarceration syndrome which continues today, and basically equipped me to go out and find a better job. For the record, I also got no discrimination from SUNY Empire State College, where I'm currently working on a graduate certificate in community advocacy. A Ban the Box recommendation was presented at a SUNY Student Assembly back in 2016, and its board complied. That made a tremendous impact for students applying to the university's 60-something college campuses all over New York State. Applying to law school was completely different. Not only did I have to craft a personal statement and check that ugly box on each application, but there were many potential boxes to check. I wonder if law school applicants who hadn't been incarcerated feel the same discomfort that applicants who are formerly incarcerated feel applying to all colleges that still have the box. Law school applications have boxes for everything, even speeding tickets. You have to check boxes if you have if you've ever defaulted on loans or been sanctioned by any professional organization or school, even if it was automatic because you made an F. For every box you check, you have to write a statement explaining why, and everything you write is effectively etched in stone, ready to be scrutinized later by bar association gatekeepers. As if finishing a master's degree and being the first person in Georgia to take the LSAT while incarcerated didn't prove my dedication, I found myself explaining why I didn't have stellar grades 20 years ago, why I lost my home to foreclosure and went into debt waiting on the state to wage a trial against me after they refused to offer a plea, why I wasn't paying my student loans while I wasn't allowed to earn income while incarcerated. 
OSCOL applications are incredibly invasive, and I think that prevents so many talented people who have extraordinary, valuable life experience, but not picture-perfect lives, from ever entering the profession. Technically, law school applications aren't themselves discriminatory. They ask about details you'll be required to talk about again when you attempt to pass a character and fitness evaluation so you can sit for the bar. But schools obviously discriminate based upon what you put in the application. Law schools go by numbers. Your score on the LSAT, or the law school admissions test, is calculated with your undergraduate GPA, and that's supposed to determine how well you'll do in school. Of course, every good lawyer knows that you can't just look at someone's LSAT score to determine whether or not they're going to be a good lawyer. Yet this is the most important factor in applying. Also, law schools only look at your undergraduate GPA. Well, my teenage self didn't make all A's. The fact that I kept a 4.0 the whole time I was in grad school in recent years would seem to be a much better indicator of how seriously I take college. Something I did each time I'd get a denial was ask the law school why they made that decision. Was it my GPA and LSAT or my felony conviction? The ones that responded always said it was my scores. That didn't make sense to me when other schools with even higher averages had accepted me. Over the course of a two-year academic cycle, I took the LSAT twice and applied to 24 law schools. I was accepted to half a dozen, all private schools, no public ones. Most insulting was the denial by Georgia State University, my alma mater. They denied me two years in a row, even after I brought my LSAT score up significantly and denied my appeal. I chose John Marshall because from the beginning, they made it clear that my experience would be an asset to the school and to the profession. They, like all of us doing this advocacy work, understand the value of knowledge. A few years ago, toward the end of my attempts to take online graduate courses in prison, someone over education told me I wouldn't be allowed to because there was no way to prevent me from interacting with my classmates. I was so confused. Interacting with classmates is a pillar of higher education, I told the woman. This obviously struck the same chord with the school I'd been accepted to not agreeing to drastically reduce the quality of education they provided by complying with this ridiculous request meant the DOC didn't want to partner with them, which meant no college access. I have found over and over again that people who don't value education and knowledge are always the first to inhibit others from attaining it and sharing it, and vice versa. This happens in our prisons, in our academia, and in our legal system. Most prosecutors and judges in the criminal legal system have never even been incarcerated. Many have never sat at the defendant's table. Effectively, they have no insight into how their decisions affect people. Over the years when I was working on my own case, I knew I was doing a better job than the sorry attorneys who had been hired to represent me. They didn't have or make the time to adequately research legal issues, certainly didn't care about the victim's needs, nor for mine, their client. They didn't have the knowledge necessary to put a good foot forward and just didn't care. Helping others as a jailhouse lawyer, there was a certain heft and pressure knowing that a person's life was in my hands. No criminal lawyer should ever practice if they don't feel that pressure. Like anything else, you have to do the best you can when you have the opportunity, and you have to make opportunities for yourself and others when you see the chance. It's high time we create equal opportunity for ourselves in Georgia and ban the box on college applications.